All right. Uh, welcome. Um, this is uh, no sequel with no compromises. Um, and this is really targeted at the uh, maybe not the broader sense of no sequel uh, that would include Hadoop. Um, uh, although we do have a uh, we being Gigaspaces has a, uh, a very good integration story with that as well. But uh, this is uh, more for uh, big data, uh, NoSQL databases, so uh, large clustered systems that try to emulate a conventional database to some degree and uh, fall short in some ways uh, in order to achieve their goals of uh, scalability and uh, performance and reliability and all these sorts of things. So those are the compromises, but uh, before I get to all that, let's. Uh, Move along. Okay, me, uh, Dwayne Philby, uh, 25 years and counting in the industry uh, from the development side, really, various roles. Um, and most recently, independent consultant that was uh, actually partnering with Gigaspaces, and then I joined them. And so now I'm uh, a technical account manager, which I, so I deal with pre and post sales engineering, um, proof of concepts. Uh, customer architecture and uh, the occasional speaking engagement like this. Um, probably more importantly is uh, I'd like to get an idea of the audience, just uh, how many of you are kind of exploring NoSQL, not actively using it at the moment. Um, okay, good, good. All right, so I don't uh, you know, assume too much here. Um, and uh, how many are planning? I mean, you're seriously in a, either a pre-production or you're seriously um, going to uh, implement a NoSQL. You're certain you're just exploring how? Okay, great. And people are actually using NoSQL in production? And NoSQL like a Cassandra, HBase, et cetera, uh, Mongo. Okay, great. So let's uh, proceed now. So why are we driven to NoSQL in the first place? Well, the lim limitations of relational databases, uh, right? And the biggest reason is bigness, right? We've uh, we typically, you know, from what I've seen, we've, out, we've outgrown um, uh, the, the data sets that we can comfortably store in a relational database. And uh, we want to push the envelope on that. Uh, Sometimes uh, not by as much as the, uh, the typical use cases that are held up, like a Facebook or a Twitter. Um, you know, uh, a few of us have, are dealing with data sets quite that large, and uh, you know, so we're looking to grow. We're looking for alternatives uh, to handle more data, perhaps crunch uh, very large data sets from our website operations and so forth. Um, we're attracted to it because of easy scaling, not cumbersome uh, clustering technology in conventional SQL databases. So scaling goes along with bigness, of course, but uh, elasticity implies scaling at runtime, implies growing a cluster to, uh, to handle very large uh, scales and scaling up as well as scaling down. Um, high availability. Um, uh, the NoSQL solutions, again, like something like Cassandra or MongoDB or HBase or React or so forth, you know, are, are very highly available. You're not reading for a single point of failure. Um, and, this, uh, and then uh, reliability and self-healing goes along with that. Okay? And the large clusters, typically, if a node fails, um, data is replicated you know, across the cluster. Um, and actually that replication is the source of some of the limitations we face with NoSQL. Um, but uh, on the plus side is, you know, uh, databases are highly reliable and the data gets moved around as needed. Uh, extreme write capacity. Uh, this can, you can be driven to NoSQL through, uh, because of the need for high write capacity, this varies. But again, goes along with the parallelism of having a large cluster of nodes, all of which can write independently. Um, of course, that extreme write capacity also produces the um, 
the parallelism which ultimately leads to some of the compromises that uh, I'll be talking about. And a uh, flexible data model is another thing. I, I'm not really certain if uh, people are really being driven uh, to a NoSQL because of a flexible data model. Uh, is that a prime uh, like driver for, for you? Who, who would say that's a prime driver? a flexible data model. Okay. That's what I figured. That, that, uh, that is a great virtue, but not necessarily what actually pushes people over the edge to, uh, to try to get um, beyond the relational model. So the compromises. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, NoSQL databases don't have any transactions. So there's a, there's a certain there's a certain uh, category of uh, applications that absolutely must have transactions. And these are typically um, eliminated from consideration as applications that can use a NoSQL database. Uh, uh, a typical example would be a financial application that needs to credit and debit an account simultaneously. Um, without transactions, obviously, uh, readers will get inconsistent views although that is a different uh, topic from read consistency. So from the, as I pointed out earlier, I'm not a DBA. I do have, my background is mostly on the development side, but uh, as far as uh, transaction isolation, you're, you're essentially only guaranteed uh, atomic rights on individual keys in these databases, not, uh, not across multiple keys. Read consistency. Um, this is one of the, the bugaboos that comes from having the, uh, the high write, uh, the high availability and the high write scaling and so forth. Um, the databases now are, tuna, tunability appears to be a, uh, a feature that has come to most of them now. Um, read consistency simply means that when you write the data in one of these, write data into this database, a reader is not guaranteed to read the value you just wrote. Okay, even if you write it to a single key. Okay, now there are many many applications where that's that's fine. Uh, you know, it's fine to wait for uh, information to propagate across a cluster, um, and and the reads, uh, you know. Uh, read uh, consistency does not matter. But there are a large, uh, there's a large uh, set of applications that require that. And they're actually built with that expectation in mind. There are ways around it that involve, you know, retooling uh, your data model and architecture. Uh, okay, no stored procedures. Typically there's no logic being executed. Um, uh, you could argue that that's a virtue, actually, right? Um, uh, I know in my career, uh, putting logic in a database was always viewed as not you know, the greatest thing in the world to do. But the fact remains that uh, many, many systems do have embedded logic in databases in the form of stored procedures. And um, you simply don't, don't get that with, uh, with a NoSQL database. Of course, no triggers. It goes along with no, no uh, stored procedures. You, know, you can't. You're not going to get events. You're not going to get notified when something happens. And security, while uh, is being nibbled at around the edges, it's immature at best. Um, and uh, you're not going to find a sophisticated uh, role-based security or Kerberos or something typically on a, on a, on a no SQL database. Yes. Um, so some. Uh, NoSQL products do have transaction consistency. Does that mean? Well, you, the only way you're going to achieve that is, and when I, especially when I was getting to uh, read consistency on uh, NoSQL, was the uh, it's tunable. So you can select consistency in the NoSQL database uh, in several of them, um, but the performance will be killed by that. You'll be having to wait for replication across the network in multiple nodes. There may also be uh, several hops involved in uh, even in writes, but uh, uh, yeah. So it's it's you can circumnavigate it, but at a performance cost. And 
part of the uh, uh, solution I'm presenting here is uh, not just providing, I mean, if you've read the description of the talk, uh, not just uh, the provision of an acid uh, transactional layer, but also extreme high performance. So the bottom line is even from the vendors themselves, there are limited use cases, and they're usually limited to, you know, uh, use cases that do not need consistency in transactions. They're limited to uh, statistical type applications too for you know, data mining and so forth. And, uh, and that's fine. There's plenty of people that can live within those limitations. But for those who would like to take an existing application that is uh, uh, talking to a relational database and use a NoSQL database instead, um, that's what this talk is about. So a no compromise, what does a no compromises architecture look like? Um, uh, acid transactions, fully consistent reads, okay, strongly consistent reads, repeatable reads, horizontal scalability, okay, and across the entire stack. Uh, Co-located native business logic, okay, this is the equivalent of stored procedures written in native business logic can be a uh, a, a language such as uh, Java or a .NET language or a, uh, a dynamic language such as Groovy or JRuby. Um, uh, Real-time eventing, okay, triggers, the equivalent of triggers, the equivalent uh, provided by a capability for doing continuous query. And by continuous query, I mean a query that's running all the time in memory, in our case, uh, and that uh, generates events when certain conditions are reached in the data store. Complex event processing. Um, you know, the ability to respond to different events uh, that occur, meaning uh, data modifications, data updates, the arrival of data, to be able to launch uh, asynchronous multi-threaded processes. Um, SQL queries, okay, so the ability to do SQL queries, I realize the, the, uh, this is not a new feature for most uh, big data data stores, but this is a feature of the overall platform. Uh, fully elastic and self-healing, so through the stack as opposed to um, a stack, uh, conventional stack, say with a web tier, app server tier, and so forth. Reads in the low tens of microsecond range. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, a cache read number, of course. Now, we'll get into the details of that in a bit. Um, uh, redundant writes in the low 100 microseconds range. Okay, these are uh, redundant writes in memory. And uh, role-based security for both uh, data and management. It was management of the cluster itself. A uh, typical compromise architecture that, that I'm seeing now. Um, essentially, what this comes, what this boils down to, is having two separate stacks. Okay. One to handle apps that can tolerate eventual consistency and uh, lack of transactions, or maybe something like this where the app tier is actually smart enough to know where to go and maybe is actually combining the two together. And that's far as, that's far as it goes, um, but we haven't solved scalability here. Okay, so the Franken architecture, yes. And this is just uh, pulling together a lot of pieces in order to produce, uh, you know, what you need. and and. Granted that some some level of uh, uh, of combining these uh, these parts and pieces together in order to construct a system is it almost seems inevitable from what I've seen, but I think we can do a lot better than that. It's got complicated, obviously many moving parts, all from different vendors, uh, many contracts, overlapping upgrades, different technology expertise, etc. Um, it's not elastic and it's certainly not in any uniform sense. And uh, it's inefficient. Um, you're going across several <coughs> network hops in a re typical request flow. 
Okay, the supercluster concept. So this is really the the end the end result of this architecture is really very simple. Now, how many of you are uh, aware of uh, GigSpace's uh, XAP product and what it is? Okay. All right. So before I get to that, well, actually before I get to this, GigSpace's XAP here. I'll go into a little bit more detail here in a few minutes. Gigaspace's XAP will sit on in front of the NoSQL cluster. Gigaspace's XAP is an in-memory, uh, horizontally scalable, uh, parallel processing platform. Um, and it's fully transactional. Memory and, uh, uh, sorry, memory. Data and uh, processing are stored in memory and scaled horizontally. The NoSQL cluster sits behind it, uh, serves data to XAP, and in, in effect, XAP serves as a sort of logical transactional <coughs> veneer or layer on top of the NoSQL cluster. Um, and uh, this is sort of a note to myself, but this layering here is logical only. We have customers that are actually mix the uh, the Gigaspaces cluster intertwine it with the NoSQL cluster on the same nodes, so it doesn't have to be a physical separation. Okay, so there's some synergies here, obviously. XAP, actually, because of its nature, really is a NoSQL solution, and by the definition of NoSQL used for this conference, it's a NoSQL solution itself it is a it could be it can be viewed as an in-memory object oriented database uh, clustered um, it's an application platform though it's not merely a data store and that's where we get the ability to execute code and produce uh, real-time event processing in front of the NoSQL backend it's not it's not uh, disk based NoSQL is um, so it's memory based. This is, in practical terms, is going to limit the size of it. Even though it itself has a very large upper limit on size, it's not going to become petabyte. And nobody's going to put a petabyte in memory probably in my lifetime. I don't know. But uh, it's a. Uh, it, it adds a. Uh, let's see. It does the transactional layer here. They're both distributed data stores. They're both highly available. They're both elastically scalable independently. They're both self-healing. And they're naturally complementary. This is just another view of it. So we have a lot of similarities uh, and overlaps here uh, between the two. And when you put the, the two together, you wind up with a platform that I think is really uh, unparalleled in the power that you can get from the parallelism of the data access to the parallelism of the processing. So here we go. It's an in-memory cluster federation. This is the XAP product. Um, storage and processing, as I mentioned earlier. Transactions with strong consistency, high availability, and self-healing. So the way that's achieved is through uh, replication here, we see, in memory. So there's at least two copies of every data element uh, normally organized on separate nodes so they can tolerate failover. Um, it is horizontally scalable, so there's a load balancing, uh, content-based content load balancing on the front of it. Data is sharded across multiple, um, multiple servers and uh, lives in memory. Memory is the primary storage medium. From XAP's perspective, memory is the database. Um, and if all your data fits in memory, that's great. If it doesn't, like we're discussing here today, you have no SQL uh, needs. Uh, typically, we would have a, a relational database behind the scenes integrated with a, uh, a store like this. Uh, but uh, the, the additional, uh, the, 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 uh, the combination of XAP with NoSQL is more compelling um, because of the, uh, the scalability, the, uh, 
what it adds to the NoSQL platform. And final, yes, XAP is NoSQL. So you can combine, here's, screws up. So here's, here's a few slides just showing how XAP takes a standard stack and collapses it. You could view this as the, the NoSQL database, and it's small, not because it's not important, but just because this is explaining XAP only. Um, we we'll take a, a standard message chair, a message broker, um, say a, a clustered me message broker in an architecture like this. Uh, messaging gets partitioned and co-located in memory. That eliminated one hop or multiple hops across the network to, to uh, retrieve and fetch messages uh, and store messages if you have a messaging uh, layer. Um, the business logic tier then also joins the messaging tier in memory as well, eliminating another hop or two. And then even the web tier, uh, the web applications can be hosted on the XAP platform and also manage the same high availability uh, process agent-based management we have to we'll provide a high availability. And then the whole stack now that's all been joined in memory um, and clustered can scale in and out, either manually or automatically based on uh, uh, performance uh, metrics. <coughs> Let's just go beyond that. That's a good close here. Okay, so XAP, just some more details on that. In memory, there's fewer physical tiers. The logical tiers, of course, still exist. Logical tiers will always exist uh, and should exist, but the, the, uh, the typical organization of a, uh, of a full application stack into physical tiers uh, has great disadvantages for scalability. Um, data partitioning, this is similar to what you would see in NoSQL database. Right? Data partitioning spreads, storage, and load, although it's not executed the same in Zap. It has the same result, which means horizontal scalability and load balancing. Um, so that's partitioning in memory? Yes. Did you say how it was partitioned? I said it was uh, content-based content -based partitioning. So when you actually when you actually uh, define the data that is going to be stored in the grid, uh, you can identify fields. The, the one thing I didn't mention for Zap, because we don't really have time to get too detailed, but um, Zap stores data as uh, business objects and, and or documents, and you can actually annotate certain fields to be uh, A, keys and indexes, and, um, and also the uh, routing indicator in the object so that you can pick uh, values that will scale evenly. So the annotations are at the instance level or metadata? Yeah, well these are actually annotations on Java classes. Java so classes. Okay. Uh, um, in the case of Java, uh, we have .NET and also. And there's also XML if you like that, you can do it in XML. So the business logic also is distributed across the cluster in memory with the data. So every node is running all business logic. So we also support a, uh, a distributed um, um, RPC capability. Uh, queries against, <laughs> against memories. Query against memories flow to the NoSQL store upon a miss. So a cache miss. I mentioned before that we're clearly not storing all memory, all data in memory because the NoSQL store is far too large. So when you run queries, these are SQL queries, you can run against the data in memory. If the data is not resident in memory, the, uh, the equivalent uh, query will be generated and run across the NoSQL cluster. Uh, the writes are persisted asynchronously to NoSQL if desired, meaning uh, you could also store data in there that doesn't go to NoSQL if you wanted to. Um, but generally the writes are persisted asynchronously and uh, they are queued in order and they're fully transactional, transactionally grouped. 
Uh, continuous query triggers event listeners with logic. We showed earlier that you get a uh, message uh, messaging in, in your cluster. You can also have uh, uh, you know procedures and events that are reacting to uh, data as its state changes or as it flows through or as it's replicated in the system. Uh, management processes in the cluster. Uh, detect failures, redistribute load, restart failed processes. So the, the system is scalable um, automatically and manually as well. And since uh, user activity throws, flows through Zap, user is exposed to Zap security. And that's the key here, right? We're all, we're flowing through this layer um, that, that hides some of the, uh, uh, the missing pieces the NoSQL system or the compromises. Um, this is just a quick overview of the transactional rate. So we can, uh, just to give an example here. Um, is the NoSQL like a third party NoSQL or is it part of the? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we have integrations now. We integrate with uh, NoSQL vendors, right? This is not, we are, we are the in memory uh, data processing uh, cluster. Uh, we integrate with Cassandra, Mongo. Uh, we have a, even have an HDFS integration, although it's the story for HDFS doesn't relate to this talk. Um, and there's others coming. Um, so the, the client will call call a service, which is exposed as a as a remoted service from from the XAP cluster. Um, Copies are made to backup nodes in memory. The NoSQL write is queued. And the typical latency for, as, as experienced by uh, the writer into memory is under 200 microseconds. Concurrent readers experience strong consistency. So I've written here, I, I'm not representing a write, but but client writes are experiencing strong consistency, meaning they're gonna read exactly what was written. They're gonna be locked out of transactions um, where that's desired. And experience essentially the, uh, the, a, a relational database-like um, experience. I'll query with a miss here. Now this is a little bit different. So we're, we're essentially running, in, in this example, we're running uh, Gigaspace's XAP as a, uh, in a LRU caching mode, meaning that we're, st we're saving uh, elements in memory that are most frequently accessed. Um, in this case, client calls a service which queries, or the client queries directly. Um, Generally, I advocate having a service layer on the grid so that you're not actually directly accessing the cluster. But either way, if the, if the data is not in memory or an insufficient quantity is in memory, uh, uh, the, uh, the SQL will actually flow through, be translated into the native NoSQL uh, query language on this end. Uh, the data will be re uh, uh, returned to memory. Um, the oldest existing data in memory will be expired if there's no space for it. And data from both uh, memory and NoSQL are returned to the caller. The typical latency, less than 200 microseconds for in memory. Obviously, if we have to penetrate to the NoSQL layer, that's going to be bounded by the NoSQL database itself. So do you guarantee consistency between the two data stores then? No, and that's an interesting point because it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, our, let's put it this way. There's, there's, there's a certain assumption here that we're accessing the data between, uh, we're accessing the data through the in-memory uh, data grid, right? So clearly, if you want a consistent view of data, period, you, you have to go through that way. Because you can't, uh, we're assuming also that we're not running in strong, no cons strong consistency mode on the NoSQL tier. But if there's a miss on the, on the memory cache, and then you go to the NoSQL store, and another read hits the memory cache, you're going to get two different reads. Because you're looking at partial data, right? If, 
I can't get two different reads because it wouldn't be, in, it's not in memory to begin with. A well, so, portion of it could be, right? Or did I misunderstand mm -hmm. that? You said if some, I thought you said if some of the data, or not all of the data was in memory, so half of it was in memory. Right. And then when I went to do a read of that half, or right. a piece of that half, I could get different reads on that. Uh, no, actually the, the read will be, well, let's see. The read in progress. I see what you're saying. The, the data that the data from the cache miss that comes back, it could be, yes, that, that is quite possible that you would get for the, the data, the remaining data uh, could be, if you weren't doing a key-based uh, selection, if it was a, say, a range-based selection, and there were multiple possible satisfiers on the NoSQL end, you could get, uh, the, the idea here, though, is that when you write when you're writing into the, into the, the data store, you could you could view the LRU memory uh, the storage as a as a queue to some extent, and reads that are against that store are going to be consistent. the The only thing that the data durability and the cache has to surpass is the length of time it takes the underlying store to replicate which is typically very fast anyway, and we're talking sub-second uh, you know, issues. So these are for the strong uh, guarantee. Um, so takeaways, this is coming out pretty long. All right, um, I think this is the key, the key point I wanted to make here at today's talk. The XAP really hides the lack of, lack of transactions and eventual consistency from client apps, and frankly, you just don't have to deal with it. Um, there's, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if you're looking at taking, uh, say, just replacing a relational database in an architecture, it's actually a possibility. Um, you can eliminate the need, as I said here, but you can eliminate the need from R RDBMS for many architectures, maybe perhaps not all, but um, from many. And of course, you get uh, XAP decorates NoSQL with real-time event processing. So you get all of the the benefits of an in-memory in data storage and distributed RPC environment um, and a complete stack. Um, the client apps experience in-memory speed and the entire architecture scales horizontally. Um, you could really almost visualize this as, uh, I know the comment earlier was do we supply the NoSQL, but these two are so complementary that you can almost imagine a product that had, had both simultaneously because they are such natural matches for each other. And I think this is an important thing. This isn't just an, some idea I had. This is actually real. Uh, we have integrations currently with Cassandra, MongoDB, and HDFS as well. But that's uh, the Hadoop story, which is a different, a different story. So if you want to see more about uh, or look at some of the, my recent activity around this, uh, this integration effort, um, check out the uh, uh, Gigaspaces blog. Um, there are a couple recent posts. Uh, Cassandra on acid. You get the thing. Elephants and eyeballs. This is actually a an integration with the uh, Gigaspaces grid with uh, both Cassandra and Hadoop simultaneously. Kind of interesting uh, use case there. And you know, we're past time, but if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.